Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Well, this Jason's mask. As a golden ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have my guest, Meg. Meg, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And shout out to Roger for letting Meg know about the show. Big shout out to you and Roger. I promise the episode will be out soon. It should be out before this one. It should be, but it'll be out soon. Should be. <laughs> and soon. And but it is it's nice to have you on though, Meg. We were talking for a few minutes just to kind of, you know, warm up. And you're an author, which is cool. Yeah, actually, I believe, I think you're the first author I've had on my show. I think I could be wrong, but I believe you're the first author. If not, everybody else, I apologize. I <laughs> not remember, <laughs> but I believe I believe you are the first author on my show. So. Well, it's my first time on the show, so that's like a milestone. So yay! <laughs> so there's that for sure. <laughs> so what got you into um, like how how long have you been writing? Is it something that you were always into or um sure um well again as i mentioned thanks for having me on the show and thanks everybody for listening um my name is meg smith and um i am an author um and i writing is basically my profession as well as a way of life um i'm a journalist by profession i've been working as a journalist for 30 years actually this year um and i recently put out um, a collection of short fiction called The Plague Confessor. And these are stories that, um, for the most part, are they're short stories that I've had published in different magazines and, and publications like that over the years. And um, prior to that, I also have five um, published books of poetry. And, um, but this is, The Plague Confessor is my first time to really bring together um, some of my short stories in a in, in a book in a professional way. So um, ex I'm excited about that and I'm glad to be able to talk about it here on the show tonight. Oh, of course, of course. Now out of, <clears throat> I'm just gonna ask you really quick with this one, this might be a tough question for you, but do you have, out of the plague, the short stories, do you mm -hmm. have a favorite story? Do I have what, sorry? You have a favorite, oh. a favorite story from these shorts? That That is a really good question and um, and a tough question, but a fair one. Um, I think probably like a lot of writers, I, I look to some degree at my short stories is almost, they are almost like your children in a way and you like them all, but you maybe like them for different ways. Yeah. Um, the, I think um, the title story, The Plague Confessor, actually is set in the Middle Ages during the time of, of the, um, the so-called the bubonic plague as we understand it. Um, in the 1300s in Europe, which, by the way, is is really um, was really a true pandemic because it appeared on at least three continents. So it wasn't only Europe involved, but um, but this particular story takes place in Italy and um, during a time when um, the Catholic Church was very much involved in the day to day affairs of most people's lives as well as their um, religious lives. And the Pope sent out a decree because all of the clergy were dying themselves of this plague, saying that um, if you can't find a priest to confess your sins to before you die, because that was an important part of their beliefs, um, he said, you can you can just confess to a, a friend. And, and if you can't find a friend, you can confess to a woman. So, so the story revolves around, um, is told by a, a legal clerk of observing everything that's going on. And the one woman in his village who's even capable of doing this task happens to be um, a prostitute. She's by virtue is the only one really going out of the house at this point. So um, so she's basically uh, responsible for dispensing salvation to um, to these poor people's souls. So um, I I feel certainly a kind of resonance with that story right now, since we are in the midst of a pandemic. 
Mm -hmm. Um, The story itself was written two years before the the terrible pandemic that we're all in. But I did feel that there were um, certain things that resonate um, with me. And that, to me, made it a a really a good fit for the lead story and the title um, story for this book. Okay. No, that makes sense. But I do love all my other children. <laughs> I, get, I get that though. Like, there's this. <laughs> just showing off that one a little bit. Yeah. Hey, there's nothing wrong. With that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I know. <laughs> I know for a fact, parents have favorite kids. <laughs> to me, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not like you love them all the same. But you're like, this one's just my favorite for whatever reason. And <laughs> <laughs> we won't drop any names on the show. <laughs> oh, I will. I know. I have my myself and my two brothers or my mom's kids. I'm the third favorite, but I'm fine with that. It's cool. She loves us all the same. Hey. <laughs> Sometimes there's less pressure that way. <laughs> there, there definitely is. <laughs> but no, like um, I like that though. I definitely wanna I definitely need to get this short this book and check definitely check it out. <clears throat> Cause I do like I I do like reading like things horror related and all that fun stuff. It's just I miss, I don't read as much as I used to, but I do, I do enjoy reading because it's just, it's one of those things to where, say if me and you read, I won't even, yeah, say me and you read one of, one of your stories, let's just say the cover story, I mm-hmm. get a completely different meaning from that story than you do, and we could both be right, and that's one thing I like about books is because it's just like, even like the visualization, like say if you're reading it or even say if you listen to the audio say if you have an audio book version of it you're like listening to with your eyes closed i may have a completely different variation of what's being read to me in the book versus you know what you may have actually meant or versus just what you feel when you read it you might even feel something different every time you read this story these stories which i think is a beautiful thing about any type of story really but i'm just you know just with the horror in general and i don't really think you get that with Maybe the only other thing you can get that with, I feel, and I could be wrong, is music, movies, to an extent. But I mean, movies, you kind of, we all see and hear the same visuals. You might have a different feel for certain characters for whatever reason, but you kind of get the same story out of everybody. But I feel like with the book, it's completely different. Like, it's it's like it's talking to you different or speaking to you different. Kind of Like I said, the only thing I can really relate that to is music. I think that's a really cool thing. Well, yeah, I would tend to agree. Um, writing is, um, I mean, all these different different art forms that you mentioned bring something different, I think, in the case of writing. And, and yes, I think the argument could be made for music is that, um, to sort of paraphrase Stephen King a little bit, he talked about skull cinema in other words that that you in it in terms of being music the listener or in terms of the um or an audio book for that matter or reading a book is that um you're kind of taking that creation from someone else into your own mind and now you've got to kind of visualize it um and the it's entirely i feel as a writer the author's job to uh, give you a roadmap that works. And in other words, if the story starts to run off the rails or or the characters become muddy or there's um, sequences in the plot that that really aren't quite logical, um, the writer, I feel, is sort of like the designated driver (laughs) and should be bringing the the reader, or in the case of audiobooks, the listener, along for the ride um, and and should be in, in control of where that's going. And yet at the same time, yes, the when you're reading a story, you are kind of bringing that task of your imagination, you know, to bear, you know, it's really like a a true dialogue, I think, between the writer and the reader. That's when it really works the best. And that's when I think it's really great. I agree with you there. Another thing I could say is like for, for books that, um, like, cause you mentioned Stephen King, the book, it read that book. And then you go to watch the newer films. And I like how, and I mean, I know it didn't, there's no movie that follows any book, like 100% complete. One, it would be too crazy. Two, it would be way too long. But I do like how with the newer It movies, how you, just from what I read, you can kind of pick out from the newer movies and you can kind of, I was like, what it's actually what I was visualizing, like the way that, for example, the way Pennywise was dressed was described in the book, the way he was dressed. And I thought, like stuff like that, I thought was pretty cool. And... I just feel, 
I don't know. I, I just like, I like, I like books like that, that to where, and I'm not necessarily with the movie thing anymore now, but Stephen King is very descriptive, very descriptive. He talks like it could be a trap. It could be damn near a chapter of him just describing something, describing a scene. But I like it because <clears throat> as a reader, it puts you in that setting. It puts you in that environment, puts you in that feeling. And it makes you want to read more. <laughs> like I'm just like, oh, man, I, I, want, I want to keep going. But I can't because I have to go to sleep or I have to get, <laughs> get up and go to work. And that, yeah. And, and that I feel really is the, the writer's task. I mean, um, a, a, a writer can sort of conceive of a story in, in their minds. Um, I could be, for example, well, anywhere in, in the supermarket or um, walking one of our conservation lands or um, or when I had the opportunity to travel abroad, for example, to um you know, Egypt and, or Turkey and, and Ireland, where my family is, um, any place that I happen to find myself could provide the idea for, for a story, which is fantastic, but it then becomes my job as the writer to make something, you know, some kind of sense out of that that's relatable to a reader who could be a perfect stranger who's never met me, doesn't know me, doesn't know anything about my life experience necessarily. All they have is that book in their hands or um or the or the story that's in front of them to read so so it's got to all work and that that's a, um you know that's a big task and that's part of the frustration um sometimes i think for most writers if they're honest you know with our, with ourselves um but that's also like the the joy too when you say you know i've really um created a story that some other person um who is an, is a total stranger to me in all likelihood is going to read and, and it's going to at least take something, you know, away from that, some kind of experience. Um, and it isn't that it will necessarily solve all their problems in life, but it might just take them on some kind of journey or some kind of experience that they've never had Which, before. That makes sense. Now, when you, when you are, I know you said sometimes you come up with ideas just in like a supermarket or whatever the case may be, wherever you are in general, mm -hmm. is there ever times where you want to write, say like a horror type story but do you have to be like in a certain mindset to do that or is it just like like how does it right no that's really a good question i think quite honestly sometimes um sometimes it starts with a little bit of an exercise and where um and and it can ha and it can come from you know really the unlikeliest of places um i I have a friend um, to whom actually one of the stories um, in this book is dedicated, um, a friend of mine named um, Tom McKittrick, who was for um, a long time a professional freak artist. And he was on The Tonight Show and, um, and he traveled around and um, to accomplish the task of being a freak artist and doing things like like dislodging his eyeballs or or pounding a nail into his head. And yeah, <laughs> we say it's a living, right? <laughs> Um, well, we would talk about that and, and he had to have a really good understanding of human anatomy and, and what, you know, what was going to fly and what was it. And, um, and that just, you know, made me think a lot about, you know, the human body itself. And, um, and so I, I wanted to, it basically in, inspired me to write this story, um, about a kid with this very strange ability to, to basically just, um, uh just basically to to dislocate any part of his body he wanted to his his brain his eyes whatever mm -hmm. um and that um but i i didn't want to write a story that was just kind of about the shocking visual spectacle of that these characters in order for the reader to care about them have to have some kind of humanity yeah. in them um it, because you can write the most shocking horrifying story ever but I firmly believe that story has, still has to have some kind of soul to it. You have to care about the people um, in in the story, and and even if you don't think they're the world's greatest people, you have to at least be engaged in what their, you know, you know what what their life story is. They don't have to be the best people. They don't certainly don't have to be perfect people. They they just have to have some kind of relatable um, element of humanity you know, to make that story work, even in, a, in even in a, a horrific setting and maybe especially in a horrific setting. I agree with you there. 
I think actually that goes across the board with uh, books and movies because you have to either you don't necessarily have to like them, but I'll say, oh, well, <coughs> I'll say it like you have to, it's either one end or the other, maybe a little in between. You either have to love them or hate them, but you can't like just feel like like nothing because then it's just you're not drawn in. You know? Yeah, and 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 it could be, and and it doesn't. I will say it doesn't have to be like a a, a super deep thing. I mean, it can be you know, an entertainment quality. I mean, we have a whole, of course, a whole subgenre in the horror industry, um, I mostly film-based, about um, basically the when when our whole market began to, to cater towards a, a younger audience and the so-called slasher films oh, yeah. came about. Well, even the slasher films are based in something. They are really kind of grow out of a sort of urban folklore. Mm -hmm. um and or stories that i think most cultures have about don't go into this place you know because something bad will happen and adolescents you know either because they've never been made aware of the what there's that there's a bad thing in the in the place or because they're adolescents and they they don't have any real good sense of their own mortality mm -hmm. you know will we'll go there um and but i i firmly believe that even there the best of those stories the stories that stay with you you still have to have something, the story still has to give you something to work with. Um, and, and the characters have to give you something to work with. Um, quite honestly, in we'll take the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, for example, the, the, the really the most unsettling moment in that film is when, is when the person goes in the house and they see a chicken in a bird cage that's obviously not meant to have a chicken in it. Yeah. And that's when, as the viewer, you say, oh, this, these people are in the wrong place. Oh, there's, a, there's a chicken in a cage that's like meant for a canary. And, and then you, you know the whole thing's gonna go terribly wrong. Um, so, but th there again, you, you even in a, um, what some people, I, and I would disagree with this, what some people say is the, the lowbrow part of the genre, which I don't, I don't fully agree with, you still have to have something there you know, that you still have to have a sense of direction um, to follow. And you still have to, you still have to care that those characters are, are there. Uh, otherwise, everything else that flows from that doesn't, um, you know, doesn't deliver much. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And Slasher is my favorite genre, hands down. <laughs> it's just, and it's funny you say, you mentioned like adolescence and all that, what got, and what hooked in the younger people, which was slashers, because that was like the first, that was probably the first genre I've ever watched that I can remember. I've been watching horror since I, between the ages of five and seven, watching them with like my older cousins and my older brother. And I mean, that was the easiest ones to get to. I mean, back in, that's just what we knew. They were the most popular ones and it's just what everybody knew and what everybody got so that was what drew me to it and it was i mean i just loved them i loved them and i i like like for example friday the 13th is probably, jason's my favorite slasher icon of all time and that's one of those i just had this conversation actually the other day with i had cj graham on the other day from friday the 13th part six mm -hmm. and one thing i told him was the friday the 13th story you know how how simple and cliche it can be whatever you want to say about it but how they're all sitting by the campfire and just telling that well what they believe is a legend or a myth of jason Voorhees. Mm -hmm. never right get tired of that story no matter what variation it is i never get tired of that story and that's just it's just i don't know what it is and i can't say it's my favorite horror movie i don't even necessarily know if i have one i'm more of like a what i feel like watching type of horror movie or you know like whatever mood i'm like okay i'll watch this well, now more so for the show. So it's like whatever people want to review <laughs> that I just want to throw that on. But I still have that same, but I don't want to sound like I don't have that same love or passion because I have that same love or passion, maybe even more so. And a good thing about this is, like I was telling you earlier, I get to meet awesome people like yourself and it opens my eyes up to, which I'm going to purchase this book. I believe I know it's on Amazon and just other movies in general, when I have other people on here, they're like, hey, have you ever seen this? You should, maybe you should check this movie out and review it. Or, you know, I would like to review this movie with you. I'm like, I've never even heard of it. And you go check it out. You either love it or hate it, which is fine. But at least you've seen it. And same thing with books. You either love them or hate them, certain books, if you're someone that reads, which is fine. But at least you gave it a chance. And <clears throat> that's one thing that's really opened my eyes with this podcast. Because before, like I was just telling you, 
for the most part, everybody that knows me that's growing up with me, I'm watching pretty much the same freaking horror movies over and over and over. Friday the thirteenth, the Halloween, you know, all all pretty much a lot of the popular ones, some of the unpo- some of the unpopular ones, more so now more of the unpopular ones, the B movies that it's just because I would just it's one of those things to where you know how people say, oh, yo, you're you you're you know, you you say you're a horror fan or whatever, but you've never have how have you never seen this? I'm just like I I was never introduced to it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like how I've never met Barack Obama. We were never introduced to each other. You introduce us, we'll meet each other. Same. <laughs> thing, I feel like it's the same with movies and books. When people say like, "How have you?" I've never been introduced to it, and that's why I've never seen it. But I'm willing to, you know, read it or watch it. And same thing with meeting Barack Obama. If, <laughs> if there was a chance, hey, you want to meet? <laughs> yeah, let's go. Well, I the 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 genre of of horror. If one even just wants to take that one genre, I mean there. To be a, a fan, um, first of all, I, I I don't sort of think that there's a any qualifications around that. People uh, decide that they they like certain movies or books, and and that maybe certain types of themes or characters resonate with them, and then they start on a what I would call a process of of exploration. Um, I I do believe that good writers are also good readers um, in the case of writing because. Uh, because it teaches you a lot about your own craft of writing, you know, to read um, other writers who have done it well and, and have shown themselves to be masters of the craft. And even to read things where you say, well, I, I did or I didn't agree with what that writer did there. Um, and uh, in, in that sense, no reading of a book. And I suppose you could argue, you know, watching of a movie is a wasted exercise. Um and, and in our culture, um, movies and and books are, um, and I suppose you could, you could add to that now our growing digital media. These are all related forms of storytelling. Yeah. They're different, but they're all related. And they all fundamentally come down to when you talk about like the kids around the campfire. Um, I agree with that because that's really the oldest form of storytelling that we as human beings have. Um, that's it. I remember um, Carl Sagan in Cosmos talking about our ancestors gathered around um, uh, campfires and maybe talked about whatever went on that day or speculated about what lay beyond in the darkness. And um, and they created ideas and, and some would say mythologies um, to explain their worldview. I know um, my mom's from Ireland and I know that my Irish ancestor certainly did things like that. And um, and as a result, we have an amazing um, wealth of storytelling in our heritage, including um, some very humorous stories um, uh, about beating the devil at his own game. We have stories of gods and, and heroes um, and saints and, and warriors. And we also have lots of kind of dark and and uh, I would some people call them scary. I, I would say they're, they're just part of Celtic folklore. Um, but just as one example of that, the author of Dracula was Irish, Bram Stoker. Okay. So, um, so yeah, the, the idea of people sitting around and, and telling stories and some of those stories exploring the darker or unknown things um, in our world and maybe good spirits, bad spirits, um, spirits who are maybe more complicated than good or bad. When you think about it, um, all those so-called slasher films, the, they they have the same ancestry, you know. They come from the same the same thing, and they they are speaking to somebody because that's why they endured and yeah. have endured. I mean, the way I look at it, Jason now versus a kid. I mean, versus a kid, I was like, Jason's cool, cool mask, cool kills. I still look at him like that, but now I'm just like <clears throat> misunderstood individual. He was an outcast and he was bullied as a kid, pretty much, and. You know, he became what his environment was around him. If you think about it, you're bullied. You're, you know, now, now he's the bully. Now he's the big guy that's just like, push me around now. Basically, Halloween, it's more of, if you go with the original, it's more of what's wrong with him. <laughs> like, why is he doing this? Because there was never really any, there was never any backstory to it until the Rob Zombie ones, which if you've watched those, are not the first one I'll say. I don't like the second one. <laughs> but, um, which... A lot of people didn't like the either one of them. A lot of people didn't like the first one because of the whole backstory thing. They thought it was better that it was more mysterious. Why you didn't know? I and I'm the type of person I love backstories, 
but I do love the original Halloween. So either way, it worked, they both worked for me. Well, I did. Well, I often get the sense that um, that kind of alienation you described. I mean, that's not it. It's it's not obviously the only theme in horror, but but it's certainly a, a recurring one. And um, and that in some cases, an individual strug- struggle either with loneliness or not feeling like they're part of the group. Because again, for our ancestors, it, it seems more and more what we understand about them is that the worst thing that could happen to you is to be excluded from the group because that put your whole survival in peril. Very true. Uh, so it's, you know, even in, in our modern times, we wrestle with that. And we've maybe in, in, in some cases somewhat, ide- in some stories, idealized the idea of the loner or the outsider. Um, you know, and I, it, I think it's something that we still struggle with. I know um, in the story that I just mentioned, um, a boy with pretty eyes. Um, that's that's kind of fundamentally what that main character is res- wrestling with, I think. And he realizes he has this zany ability. Um, and I'd be glad to read just a couple of um, paragraphs, of you know, for the, uh, you know, for everybody listening. Of so, um, okay, great. So this is the story called, as I mentioned, a boy with pretty eyes. I first wrote it back in the 1990s, um, and um, it is dedicated to my friend Turbo, Tom McKittrick, who, as I mentioned, was a professional freak artist. And um, we would have these these very um, uh, certain, maybe not the, I'm not going to say we were the only people sitting in Dunkin' Donuts talking about how to dislocate your eyeball, but <laughs> we were, we, you know, uh, we did do that. So, um, so I'm just going to read a, a couple of paragraphs um, from the beginning. The story is a boy with pretty eyes, and it's dedicated to Turbo Tom McKittrick and his freak show, Extravaganza. There's a lot of play with the muscles that hold the eyeball, Ben said, in that knowing tone of voice that had long ago alienated him from most of his fifth grade class. Here, during the class science demonstration projects, he wasn't about to win them back. He had decided on this course of action initially because it seemed less likely to get him beat up than did showing his homeroom how an abacus works. He reached into the front pocket of his jeans, which sagged on him, and he pulled out a butter knife. Before the teacher could stop him, he wedged the knife spread around between his lower eyelid and one of the dark brown eyes, which his grandmothers had said would always be his only redeeming features. One of those two redeeming features was now a free floating globe, balanced on the edge of the knife's blunt edge. It was only then that the teacher, Mrs. Burston, broke from her stupefying horror, leapt up from her desk to escort Ben to the nurse's office. But inches off her chair, however, she froze once again as if Ben's disconced miracle of sight had shot a paralyzing beam through her. She thumped back onto her chair and gazed at him, her face shiny, her mouth open but petrified, and something between shock and ardor in her eyes. Vaguely, she heard gasp cries and perhaps the thud of someone fainting, and then applause from the rows of spellbound students. Ben, rather unceremoniously, popped his eyeball back into its socket, as if pocketing a marble, and made a campy bow before returning to his seat. The display was disgusting, but effective. Ben had won the day. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. I like that. <clears throat> I like that. How many um excuse me, how many stories are in that book? So, you know, here's a number I should know right off the you know, right right from the outset, but being a journalist, we have jokes about journalists and math. I will tell you. There's 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10. So 10 stories exactly. Nice. Um, in this book with a uh, kind of a, a range of, of body horror and um, what was kind of known back in the nineties. Um, you heard the term splatter punk a lot. There's um, there's some Gothic horror in there um, and some science fiction and historical fiction. So, um, so I, I do feel proud of the ability to put together a good, a good array That's of a, stuff. A nice mix. Thank you. Now what it, what inspires minus like, the journalism, like say putting that to the side, what inspires you now to like write a story? Well, you know, I find that, um, you know, a short time ago, I, I've always written 
you know, short fiction and some novellas and things. But it's, uh, not too long ago, I decided that I would do what I kind of think of as a rededication to that part of the craft. And quite honestly, I found that once I did that, and I, because I, I think like a lot of writers, I went through kind of a struggle where for a little while I felt like maybe I'm overthinking this process. Um, every writer wants the story to be good, to be the best that it can be. Um, and that's all fair, but, but maybe the first thing I really need to do is just go and lay some track mm. um, and then go back and, and, and do all the things that might need to be done to write a story. And I found that once um, basically what I do, this is the truth, is when an idea, any idea, even if it's just a flash of an idea comes to me, I will create a, a Word document and, and I will write. I might sit, you know, sit down for a while, however, an hour, however long it takes and write it all out. Um, and then a couple of things will happen. I'll either come right back and finish your you're right. Your readers can't see me typing, but um, <laughs> but you know, I'll just pound it out and then go back and pretty up. Or, in some cases, I'll be quite honest. I have stories that I've kind of literally put aside because I really just wasn't sure what to do with them. And then the the missing piece of the story will will come to me if I just patient with it. Mm. Um, and so I go back and and just patch it in. And um, I think about what Ray Bradbury, who's one of my big inspirations, Ray Bradbury said, just write a story every week. It's impossible to write 52 bad stories in a year. I have a, you know, here's another question on still what you were saying about like putting a story to the side and going back to it later on. Mm -hmm. Have you ever put a story to the side and then maybe started another one and something just clicked in your brain like, oh, crap. That last story I was writing, I I know exactly how I want this story to go. Do you like pause? Or have you ever paused from the one story you were write started writing? You know, later on, and then went back to that one. I have it in my mind. I have to put it down right now. I've I've definitely done that. Yeah, I've I've absolutely done that. Um, I've had stories that I, I found I was able to just write in a matter of a couple of days or or a week to you know Ray Ray Bradbury's proverbial week. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I have found that um, it is possible if, if a person tries to maintain some organization, you know, to have more than one story going, um, to your point, at the same time. I think every writer, you know, works a little differently. I would never be in a position to kind of say, you know, to try to tell someone else how to write. But I only know what works for, for me. And, and yeah, some, sometimes it's... Um, yeah, it can it can be as simple as what you're saying. You know, it will just you will be somewhere and it will hit you. Yeah, that's that's the ending I needed, or that's the middle piece I needed to connect the beginning and the end. <laughs> if one writes a story that starts with you know these people were here and this happened, and then you kind of jump jump to the end and you're like, and then they they died or whatever happened to them, and you're like, all right, how do I how do I bridge that gap? And uh, yeah, sometimes you end up writing the, the middle last. <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> that makes that does make a lot of sense, though, because I feel, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm a writer at all, but I feel like when you're coming up with a story or something, you have like, it's kind of like when you're writing a, a school paper, you have the intro in your mind, or you may even have it written down, and you know how you want it to end, but it's just that middle, the, the meat and potatoes, I guess, so to speak, you're just like, okay what can I do to fill this out? And then there's other times, which again, going back to my school days, where you'll have the middle part and the beginning of the end, you're like, okay, what? Like, I understand. I know what I want the story to be about. I just don't know how to open it or how to close it. And it just, I, it's, it's so funny the way the human brain works. Now everyone is so different. Like I, I keep using school as an example. because That's like the last time I remember actually writing something out. To, to you know from beginning to end but um i remember one of the one of the assignments i don't remember the exact story but one of the assignments was um we had to we could change the ending of us it was a story where a guy i don't know what crime he committed this was years ago but anyways in the story he, he committed some crime and it was like a an older story when they used to do like town hanging and stuff hanging hanging and stuff and mm -hmm. So in the, in the book, I believe in the original story, he, they hang him at the end. But in mine, I made it because they, they hang him. When they hang him, they like hang him. You know, the thing drops. But it was like over a body of water. And I made it so like the rope broke somehow. 
and he survived and lands in the water. I don't remember where I went with it. What I do remember, though, which was funny, is I handed it in about two weeks late because I really wanted to make a good story out of it. Like, I didn't want to just write something down. And my teacher, I handed it in, and she wrote on it in red, you know, C plus or whatever. She's like, Aaron, this would have been an A if you handed it in on time. <laughs> <laughs> Go. But I, I like the day that I handed it into, I think I literally finished it the night before. And I always didn't. I Again, another thing I do enjoy. I did enjoy doing. I don't know if I enjoy it as much anymore. It was just like writing or like finishing a story. Just because it just seemed fun. But it it takes. For me, at least, because I know that some people could just do it like that. But for me, it just takes longer for, to get that out on paper, like to get all your thoughts out and to get it out to where it makes sense. And especially, in the, again, going back to the school setting, okay, like this is your deadline. You have a week or two weeks. And it's not like that's all my only assignment. It'd be one thing if I just had to write just that paper and had no other classes. But it's like, okay, you have five classes a day, every day, Monday through Friday in high school. And you have to, you know what I mean? You have to keep up with everything else. Plus, I'm like, oh, man. <clears throat> well, if I, if, I had, um, if, if I had had your teacher and I was approaching... Um, say one of my short stories that, that I've written um, in the way that I just described, I probably would have gotten a C plus two because only for, and probably for the same reasons, because, um, you know, because it, because it took me so long to get to that point. Um, and in the writing world that happens, I think, if memory serves me correctly, I, I think the story um, is the classic story um, occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, um, by Ambrose Bierce, where yeah, a man's being hanged, but he ha but he has these kind of flat. Basically, the the reader sort of led led to believe that the guy actually goes free and he's running and he sees his wife and his child and that's when um, you know that that's when they pull the, the lever on him. Um, so yeah, but I but um, the idea of saying well, well, what if that didn't actually happen? What if like you said, if he if he fell into you know that made the rope broke and he he fell in into the the body of water underneath and made his escape it's it's, it's actually funny that i remember that assignment I remember the parts of that story but it was um the thing was <clears throat> you could either write a story you can continue the story with him surviving or whatever or whatever you wanted you can have a you can write like a newspaper article or a eulogy i think those are the three things there might have been one other thing and i was like i want to continue this story i said because i don't really i said the other two just aren't really doing it for me at that time i was like this continue this story and kind of making it my own would be fun and i just remember in big big red letters she, <laughs> she, it she not only did she write it but she told me she's like this would have like, this is a really good story it would have been an a if you just handed it in on time i was just like i literally just finished it like yesterday well, it takes i i have a story coming out in in a, in a fantastic um magazine called dark dossier and that story um, I started back in um, back and gosh, I think it was about April. And I and I put it aside because I felt I had written myself into a corner and I would, as it were, and or and and I would take it out periodically and look at it. And it just wouldn't um, you know, I would bring the characters and everything up to a certain point. Um, the story, um, so I live in Massachusetts, the story happens to take place in, in Salem. Mass and um, and there's a lot of history and also misconceptions of, of history about Salem Mass and, and the witch trials mm -hmm. that took place there and, and so forth. Um, but it's set there in, in contemporary times, and um, and it and it really was. I'm not sure why this is particularly, but it took me a, a long time. It literally took me a, a couple of months to. Um, and in the meantime, I was writing other stories and doing other things. But it it just took that time to for um for me to pull together um other elements uh, because i started thinking about burning the witches in salem were not burned that's one of the misconceptions that we have but i decided that maybe what that character needed was to overcome some kind of traumatic experience with fire um and that uh so so i thought about that and um and and I thought about um, you know other real life historical incidents, Joan of Arc being burned at the stake, or um, the um, the Triangle Factory fire. And I am to do this if you know incorporating people who actually had terrible things happen to them. Um, I try to do that very respectfully, 
Um, yeah. And so, um, and, and hopefully I have done that with some justice and humility in, um, and that, but it, it took that whole process <laughs> to get an ending for that story. And, um, so, and, and I, and I feel, you know, hopefully that I succeeded because, um, you know, I, I feel very grateful and humbled to, um, be published in, um, dark, dark dossier, which has published a, a, a few other of my stories. Um, awesome. so when you get to that point, you feel like, yeah, this is, um, you know, it, it's nice to, you do feel like, yeah, you know, the effort is, is worth the struggle in the end. Yeah, I agree. I can agree with that. I can definitely agree. agree with that. It's just that it's just, just a few times that I've done that. <laughs> it's the, it's the process. It's, and if, I mean, this is back when, I mean, in school, cause I'd probably do it different now as far as the way I out or you know you do the outlines and all this other stuff and just kind of just so you can get your ideas down and kind of put them together at the end i'd probably do that way different <clears throat> but uh i don't know <laughs> it was it was a it was a fun process and i do i do kind of miss it to an extent but I think I want to try to do if I do if I get back into something like that, I want to do storytelling in another way. Like even I was actually talking with my wife and with a few friends about doing like um just like short, maybe five, 10, 15, 20 minute cheesy, fun horror, little horror shorts, but like video, like little simple videos and just, well, just I, yeah. you know, some well, sort of story. And have well, fun. I, I'm, I always say that, you know, if a, if a person feels inspired to do something, I mean, why not? Um, you know, take it from Skull Cinema, like Stephen King mm -hmm. says, you know, and, and put it out there um, and well, see, see what I, it becomes. I definitely plan to. I'm just like all right, right now I'm just brainstorming. Like I have, which I'll tell you off, off you know, when we're done recording, I have like a, a small, simple idea of what I want to do. And I asked a couple of people if they would do it too, as well. And they were just like, yeah, of course, why not? It would be fun. Something simple, just something simple. And because of COVID, everybody would be just people. Everybody be in their own homes. <laughs> Every and they just you know we just record something. They just send me the video. And we kind of put the stories together like that. But just well, it's, it's probably it's probably been said a lot of times, and maybe more by people more eloquent than I. That um, I, that I think that through this whole terrible time that we're living through in the in this past year um with the coronavirus crisis but but all the other things that that have played out in its wake that um have i i given people i think in some in some ways really um a need to explore those um those feelings of fear and anxiety and and where are we all going with this thing exactly mm -hmm. um i think that you know certainly as a, as a journalist um i can say that um, you know we find ourselves in a, in a place where uh, many inequities within our own society, I think, have been laid bare as as a result of this pandemic, the pandemic, and the response, and who's the most adversely affected, um, and why that is so. And that, in the real world, if you will, has given I think every single one of us a lot of really tough things to look at um in in honesty and if we are at all honest you know we will look at what those answers are however uncomfortable they might make us all mm -hmm. if we're truly intent on finding a way out of this crisis but not only that but that are, are we going to begin to try to resolve some of the, the the terrible truths that have now been laid bare in its way um and i think in when when people are going through a crisis of that magnitude Sometimes, quite honestly, I think it is helpful to tell stories, to make art yeah. from it. Um, I would never pretend that it that it it is a curative, but I think it helps. Um, and I think it's a natural process. Again, going back to our ancestors telling stories around the campfire, it kind of gives a place to put those emotions, and we can. Um, and and sometimes they can even be, um, you know, therapeutic, if I can use that. I know that word is overused a lot, but I agree. Sir, yeah. Uh, and sometimes I, we feel like, well, this didn't solve the world's problems, but I kind of feel like I've taken my, my feelings and instead of them just letting them rage around in, in my brain, you know, I've crafted something, you know, from it that I can share. 
I would um, say raging around in your brain or you craft you could say you crafted something or you acted out in a responsible way like for for you would be putting on putting it on paper or typing it up and for someone who like say what i was just saying would be well because i only have my cell phone as a camera right now or something like that but picking up my phone and just recording something doing something just to not that i'm angry or anything but just putting some sort of creativity out there some sort of story out there and it just gets those, like you're saying, for those people who have to get those emotions out instead of saying, instead of someone going out looking for trouble, looking for a fight, it's like, just be creative with something and kind of maybe tell your story. There's ways you can tell a story of why you're angry or upset, but make it in like a creative way to where it's not just, oh, I'm mad, poor me, poor me, poor me. It's like, okay, this is this is why I'm upset. This is why, but you're putting it into like a, a story as far as, you know, visual or written or whatever you want to do or in a song. And to where people will read it, watch it, listen to it, and just a lot of people can will actually re- relate to it. Which which it's it's funny in a sense because of again how you're saying the way this whole year panned out, and it's like there's a lot of crazy things that went on and opened a lot of people's eyes, for better or for worse, opened a lot of people's eyes. And you're just like, okay, there's there's a lot of things to where if you want to say there's you know there's people on this side and people on this side that where a lot of us can meet in the middle and relate to a lot, but everybody on this side, everybody on this side, just blah, 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 this and blah, 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 that. Nobody really wants to listen. And that's what I feel with creators as are, you know, you with writing, me with the podcasting now, and again, with other creators and music and movies and everything else. That's one thing where I feel like creators can kind of draw that line. Like, okay, just everybody just sit down and kind of listen to this story, watch this movie, listen to this song and just get something out of it. Good or bad, get something out of it. Well, I think as long as, um, as people like ourselves try to create um, that space in some way. Again, there'll never be an expectation of solving all of those problems, but I think it, if there's at least a way to give a voice to it and to listen perhaps as well as speaking, um, then both in art and, and in life, maybe we can find a way forward. Um, and by the way, I, I do think there's, there's a lot of great movies, there's a lot of great stories out there that, um, that do that, that can bring forth, you know, some of some of these kinds of, of truths. And though they're not charged with solving them, um, they can be a great um, mirror for them, and maybe help other people who aren't part of that experience to to understand it somewhat. Um, and um, I I know that, for example, one of one of my people sometimes ask, well, you know, what's a sometimes in in like those there's different Facebook groups about um, different kinds of horror stories and movies. I'm sure you're probably part of some of them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, you know, the question will come up, well, you know, what's a good ghost story to read? Ghosts being, you know, an important subgenre of horror. Um, and I always, and, and, um, and, and one of the stories, you know, when I'm presented with that question, I, I will always say, well, um, you should really read Beloved by Toni Morrison if you haven't read it. Um, because it's, it's the device of basically, a, a woman who murders her own daughter to um, as her one way of, of protecting her from um, enslavement or being sold into slavery. This is what she does. And the daughter comes back as a ghost um, and inserts herself into the world of the living. Um, and so uh, this is a powerful story, but I think tells a part of our nation's history in that way. And and that's kind of unexpected Mm -hmm. Um, and is a, is a supernatural thriller, but is still talking about something that really and and truly happened. Um, And so in those ways, I think, yeah, I think the art that we can create, you know, can, um, you know, can move some things in an important way. Um, you know, if we all we all try to see the way forward, as it were. I know I'm not the first person to say that. <laughs> no, I get it though. I mean, I like it. I like it. It's just, I, I will say a positive with this whole pandemic is you see a lot more creators creating because they have nothing else to do. And I'm just saying, like, <laughs> up as, an, as an example, like I was saying earlier to you, how <clears throat> I was basically home, getting paid, yes, but I was bored. I'm just like, okay, there's only so much you could do. So I do have a podcast when I just, and I recorded a ton of episodes and it just, and in that time, I will say I've gotten better with everything. 
all around. Like I'll just use visuals, for example. I've gotten a lot better with my visuals from when I very first started using my green screen till till today, let's say. And I'm sure by next month I'll be better at it. And same thing with my audio. The same friend I was telling you about to help me set this up helped me fix my audio so my audio sounds clearer, clearer. And the funny thing is, is he I'm in I'm in upstate New York and he's in North Carolina. So we literally did this through Zoom through a Zoom conversation. He was like, okay, just do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. And you know, just stop. So if you're in upstate New York, then you have a lot of shoveling <laughs> to do it. Yes. Right. Because my my parents still live there. Um my father moved there that years ago. We lived in Syracuse for a brief time. And yes, the late the term lake effect t- took on this whole other um, meaning. Um, and, and even though New England winters are quite volatile, um, I definitely saw some awe inspiring things <laughs> when I lived up there. I just have yeah, to I'm say, a, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but I'm in Schenectady, New York, which is right outside. Okay, yep, yeah. yep, of Albany. And yeah, we got about two and a half to three feet of snow, and it it, it wasn't fun. <laughs> It wasn't fun at all. I mean, I can't complain too much because, again, like I told you, I was working from home. But, you know, the wife doesn't work from home, unfortunately. So there had to be some shoveling done. And <laughs> You're uh, all. There's still a lot of work to do. But, hey, you know what's cool about the, around just mentioning the snow really quick is in the neighborhood we're in now versus the last neighborhood we lived in. Last neighborhood we lived in, the outside shoveling, your neighbors just come outside just go on about their business, act like they don't even see you. Here, everybody's helping. Like, this whole block is helping each other, shoveling. A few people have snowblowers. They'll go up and down the street and help each other out, help dig each other's cars out and all this other stuff. I was like, this is this is how it should be. <laughs> if people can do this, treat each other, be nice like this every day around the world, this place would be, this pandemic would have been over. It would have never started. It, just, it would have just been so much different. No, but, we certainly would have gotten our snow cleared up <laughs> sooner. <laughs> Indeed. Um, well, unfortunately, it's a it's still a school night for me. I'm afraid, um, okay. so I'll have to power down pretty soon to uh, so I can I can face the world of news once again <laughs> with a hopefully clear mind. Yeah. Uh, but um, but if I could just give a um, you know since we're talking about my book, The Plague Confessor, um, if I could just give a um, first of all just a quick. Um, Shout out. I wanted to certainly give um, thanks to my um, awesome publisher, Eric Stanway, who's um, an amazing and accomplished graphic artist and and writer in his own right. He's published, um, he's written several books. We worked together um, at a newspaper in central Massachusetts. That's how we got to be friends. And um, and his publishing house is um, Emu Books in Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire. And um, also, of course, I wanted to um, really thank my husband, Derek Savoya, who's supportive of everything that I do and um, certainly supportive of my struggles as as Joyce as a writer. And um, those who are interested, it is available on Amazon, as you mentioned. And also um, people can contact me directly. Um, I'm on Facebook at Meg Smith Writer, um, Twitter at, at Meg Smith underscore writer. And um, my webs my website megsmithwriter.com. And I love hearing from people and what they thought of the the book. Um, so um, people who've gotten the book and read it, you know, definitely give me a shout, you know, and share your thoughts. Awesome. So uh, you know, because truly is a conversation. Awesome. And thank you. Thank you again for coming on. Um, all of, when, once this episode comes out, I'll have all the links down below. And great. I believe they are in the email, but can you just send them in the links again? Yeah, I definitely will. And like I said, I'll have them once this episode comes out, I'll put them down below so everybody can go grab your book. And if they want to talk yeah. to book with you and anything like that, definitely do that. People, great interview, such a nice person. And I, I can't wait to get the book myself. Oh, so. thank you so much. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to have me on the show. Um, oh. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and um, thank you for providing a, a forum for uh, for writers and creators like myself to talk about what they're working on. Oh, um, and, and best of luck. I hope to hear more about your endeavors as well. Anytime. Yeah, you definitely will. <laughs> you definitely will. And I want to thank, like I said, I want to thank you again to all the listeners, everybody out there. The links will be down below for her as well as myself, which I mean, my listeners, you should know where to find me by now. So I'll just drop my links down below. 
And as always, I'll see you in your nightmares. Oh, well, I will uh, put that in.